Welcome to Intro to Astro 2024. Okay, welcome back everyone to the second live session of Intro to Astro 2024. Um, today we will actually introduce you to uh, Python, Jupyter Notebook, and various Python packages, including NumPy, SciPy, AstroPy, and Canvas. Um, so without further ado, let's begin with the first topic. And our first speaker is Shitan. Uh, hey, everyone. Hi, Fei. Am I audible? Yeah, you are best soft, but we can hear you. All right. Great. Um, yeah, so I won't be able to like turn on my camera today. Uh, I'm like traveling and my net is kind of shaky, but yeah, I'll try to just give me a second. I'll share my screen. Thank you. All right, so maybe we can get started. Um, yeah. So hello, everyone. My name is Peter Javla. I think some of you already know me from the last week's session uh, where we discussed Unix and Git. Today I'll be talking about Python and a bit about Jupyter Notebooks. And this, uh, like this particular notebook is a bit comprehensive and it's really text heavy notebook. So I'll not go into the exact details. You can read this out on your own at your own time, but I'll cover the you know, like brief topics on what Python is, how we can use it, and like what is the power of Python, like what all we can accomplish with it, and then uh, what is your assignment, and finally, like what how we can use the Jupyter notebooks as well. So it will be a bit hands on. So if you do have Python installed already on your computers, you can follow along whenever we switch to the dummy. All right, so starting on. Python is a high level programming language and what that means is like we discussed Unix last week where we talked about some commands that we give to the computer. I just request everyone to please stay on mute. Yeah, thank you. Yeah, so we discussed Unix last uh, week where we discussed that it takes in a bunch of commands and executes them um, directly on the command line interface. Now, when we talk about Python, it says that it's a high level programming language, which means like in very layman terms, it means it's a very complex, uh, you know, programming language, which takes on more complex set of commands, which again are in a particular syntax that is a bit different from Unix, uh, where Unix can be compared to a more bare bones kind of command structure, while Python is more you know, has a greater layer of abstraction over it and can achieve much more like complex functions, complex things through it. Um, where Unix is better in terms of usage is it is really fast. It is really fast as compared to Python. But where Python outshines Unix is the functionality that it delivers. All right. So it also has a particular syntax as we just talked about and you can, uh, you know, like we did in Unix, we can echo something on the screen in a similar way. We can print our whatever string we want to print. So here I am printing my own name at a second uh, with the keyword, keyword print and this print is the syntax for doing that, that thing, right? So every command in Python, you can call it as a statement and then statement grouping in python like in a script whenever we are grouping some commands in unix in similar way in python we can group some commands or the statements and that is done using indentation that means we put in some tabs uh, to indent things and new commands are again separated by new lines so very very much similar to how we do it in unix now python also has one more thing which is called object oriented programming in which we can make uh, objects which has have some pro properties like it has some abstraction it has encapsulation it has uh, reprodu reproducibility so these are all properties on of an object but what you need to understand over here is we can make new objects of code in python that 
can take on certain functionality and that functionality can be used in a modular way in numerous numerous situations and then over here we have like written what is the difference between unix and python which are, which we already discussed um, that unix scripts are based at like changing text data due to the high speeds so it's more useful over there but python has a huge variety of users which we'll discuss in a bit all right so first of all let's start with the distribution and anaconda dis what is anaconda distribution but to know what is a distribution we must know like what are functions modules and packages in python and a function in a python python is something that can take on an input and that gives us an output by processing a bunch of commands right so again like in unix we put in a bunch of commands uh, to perform a task that can be grouped as a function that takes on an input and that can give an output now when we bunch in a part like when we bunch in these uh, functions into a you know into a more useful module that means it we are bunching in some kind of some typical kind of functions together so let's say that i want to do some task that is related to working with a particular satellite let's say it is and all the data that i need to use for that i can bunch in those functions into a single file and call it a module that has similar set of functions to perform or to perform some tasks and when we bunch in a lot of these files together that is called a package so a package in all is kind of a end to end you know useful to get that someone like you or me can build on python and it, it will have a bunch of modules which are files and those files will have internally a bunch of functions which can do certain things by taking in inputs and taking uh, like giving out outputs and those functions in in themselves are a bunch of statements that we that can be used to solve certain things so these packages that you and i are developing these can be you know distributed via distributions and this is what a distribution is it bunch bunch in a huge ton of packages into a single you know into a single distribution and anaconda is one such distribution which you know which has all these useful packages that are used in python generally by astronomers and scientists overall so you can download this distribution for python and it will get you the uh, required packages for the whole workshop i'd say and even as well um here's the link you can go out there to the website and follow their instructions if you are low on storage you can go with miniconda um, which is a minimal installation uh, like it has some less packages than the whole installation but if you have space you can go with anaconda distribution all right moving forward yeah so anaconda also has one more thing so what it does is it can create some isolated workspaces for you and what that means is let's say that i'm working on intro to astro workshop i can create a workspace which has packages that i need for this particular workshop now when i go on to another workshop i work on a different project that does not need all those uh, packages i can have an i can have a very isolated space where i like install certain versions of certain packages only and those will be very those will be isolated from the ones that are for intro to astro so in a way it, it helps you organize your projects uh, and the packages that are required in so that there is no conflicts or there are no version issues further on so let's see how we can use python hands on i'll just open my terminal uh, again it can be used through a terminal it can be used through other other sources as well it can we can make scripts and we'll just talk about them in a minute so if you were to see here it's written base over here base means that i have installed anaconda installation on my laptop and this base is one of those uh, isolated workspaces that i just talked about the base workspace that i'm right now working on and if i were to write python on my uh, terminal and this will work for both windows and mac 
it should open up my Python. So now, right now, I can see the version of my Python is 3.8.5. I can now write in my commands over here. And also, you can see uh, I have this Anaconda distribution installed over here. So now I can write my statement. So let's start with print. And let me print hello intro to Astro participants. So this is a string that I want to output. And I wrote a function. This function was print. It took in an input which was this string and every input can be put in those these parentheses. If I press enter then it will print this statement hello into do astro participle. If I were to also use a package so I can use a package that is built by me or by someone else and these some packages built by someone else uh, can be open source that means they are free to use by anyone. So the and, and Python also has certain packages that are inbuilt. So let me try and use one package which is called OS. If I have to use a package, I use this statement import. That means that all the functions that were present in OS will now get imported in my current environment, in my current Python. Okay. And if I try to use a function from this particular um, package which is os dot that means that i'm using a function that is present in this package i'll write os dot and then the function name let's say get cwt this gets me the current working directory similar to what we did in unix we tried to type out the present working directory so it will tell me where i am currently in my computer all right so we have already done two things with python Let's move on and see what else can we do. I, I'll just write one more command. So we can also do some arithmetic that we can also do with Unix. And let me type in 1 plus 2. It gives me 3. All right, let me move back to this. So we already tried all these things till here. Yeah. Now, if what if I want to do this via text file? I mean, I want to have a bunch of commands execute at the same time not in a manner that one statement gives me one output like i was just doing on my uh, unix so for that i can make a text file or more more appropriately the text file should have a dot py extension at the end so that becomes a python file and it's a script similar to how we did uh, what we did in unix that means it bunches in a uh, couple of commands or statements to get certain outputs and it those all statements could be executed at once like one by one and this can be done using a text editor and sublime is one text editor that is very minimal and very good for use and i can show that to you as well sublime yep so this is a sub this is sublime text editor i have some installations pending but what we want to do is we want to do one plus two okay this is a new installation yeah, it's kind of updating but yeah um, i want to print this and to let me print the string let me do one more thing let's create in variables and let me also tell you what variables are so variables are kind of placeholders in our memory in python that can take a value and that value can be an integer it can be a decimal or it can be something in a text format so let's say i put in a as one and b as two and i'll print a plus b then it should give me one plus two that is three Right, and this is a text file that I just created. I this now. What is the use of this text editor? Sublime text. You can you know uh, do things like you can have build system. So that means you can do uh, run the code over here as well. You can view your a particular uh, text file in a given format. I can select the 
syntax as python because i'm working in python and it color codes everything that makes it easier for us to read and understand the code so you can see all functions are like written in blue all strings are written in yellow and so on and then i can also do the build so that would actually run this whole code and the editor itself um i think there was some issue to, to, to yeah i guess there was some issue well there is some installation issue but yeah let me show this to you otherwise let me go to intro to astro python and let's do test python so i am storing this as a .py file which is a python file that i can execute later let's store it so i have this file stored if i want to execute this file let's go into this particular um, folder i'm in week two sorry and then i need to run test python so i'll write python and then the file name and it should run this thing so it is printing three which is a plus b and then it is printing welcome to intro to astro so you can see I did two things at once, which I would, which I was doing one by one. So first two was here, and then this was here, right? Um, this is a Python script. Moving back. Yep. So you can see this Python script was useful for executing a bunch of commands together. But what about having some more information inside this uh, particular script? Over there, Jupyter Notebooks are really useful. What you are seeing right now is a Jupyter Notebook. Um, over Jupyter Notebook, we can have images, we can have videos as well, we embed things. So we over here you saw a website that was being embedded and you can click everything over here. This is all operational, right? Um, and you can execute code in here. So this thing that we can, we just talked about, I made A and B as two variables. And I'm printing out the sum difference division and multiplication of these two variables and if I were to run this I can do run and this should run over here and this output was just generated uh, again all right so this is Jupyter notebook and its use is you can see it's very useful in a way that we can have text we can have code that can run we can have images and uh, web embeds and so on in one place so in that way it is also really useful and how to open this up so i can move on to a term terminal let me open my terminal yeah i'll just go into this folder um so currently i am in let's see where i am ewt i am in intro to astro 2024 folder which is the git folder for our workshop um and if i were to uh, done Jupyter Notebooks, I can simply write Jupyter Notebook that should open up this Jupyter Notebook over a, f uh, over a web page which is locally hosted on my computer only, it's not on the internet and then I can go to Wake to Python and then you can see some bunch of um, Python Notebooks and over here I have this Python and Jupyter intro via PYNB which I have already opened over here and this is a Jupyter Notebook that we can run we have some other functions over here as well so each block can be run or stopped or rerun in a way these blocks can be turned up or down so i'll i can do this and this like wherever i want to place the block then there are some copy and edit commands for there um you can also see this kernel thing so what this kernel means is that uh this repeat at the back end is connected to a python uh Python instance and you can interrupt or restart that instance in case something goes wrong all right moving on I'll just move on um, there is one more helpful thing over here if there is a function that you need to know what what it does what inputs it takes and so on you can write this particular command uh, question mark at the start of the function name and then run this and it will tell you what this does in, like, based on the documentation that the author has given all right
and now we have just two two more things before we close this session um one is talking about the power of python and by that i mean i i will just so before we move forward this is something that will be discussed in detail in the coming weeks and you will be making those parts as well for now it's just for purpose of uh, telling you how powerful python is and how easy it is to implement these things in python so over here i what i am doing is we are, i am reading in the data of 20000 stars from gaia and that data is uh, has 97 columns of data and to 20000 rows of course and i am figuring uh, i am making a figure out, out of those so that i can get the positions of all these stars in a manner so the these are ra right ascension and declination which are kind of coordinates of the star in this uh, coordinates of the stars in the sky and this is how it can be plotted and let me run it for you right now so if i were to press run you can see it oh wow well, it's throws an error i'm sorry um no file okay i'll have to put that file over here again but yeah um, i'll just show this over here i think i deleted some files over github but uh, this runs in under a second and you can see how uh, like how it can deliver such excellent results in such a small lines of code and this is possible because we have packages and we have inbuilt functions and we have open source packages especially in python and even i have similar thing in 3d so this whole diagram is doing the same thing it's just in 3d and it is having some extra bunch of information like the temperatures of stars are color coded and the positions are like in three three dimensions also the sizes of the stars are like relative so uh, the bigger dots are the bigger stars while the smaller dots are the smaller stars and then moving on we have google collab and jupyter lab so these are online hosted jupyter notebooks in case you do not have a really powerful laptop or uh, I mean, this works with a very minimal setup as well. But if you want to still work on internet and use resources that are freely provided by Google or Jupyter Lab, you can also use these Google Collab and Jupyter Lab, which are basically online Jupyter notebooks. And then lastly, we have an assignment. So this is software data carpentry. Uh, again, similar to what we did for Unix. Your assignment is simply to um, get all the plots that you make out of this workshop and post it on the assignments folder and yeah this is pretty much it yeah Faye, you can take it over and for any questions you can do right in chat and i'll answer them thank you so much Shidan. uh maybe we should pause for questions for this session yep sure folks if you have questions feel free to post in the chat or unmute yourself I think there's a question. Is there a difference between echo and print? Yep, so right. Echo is basically used in Unix, whereas print is a function that is used in Python. So first of all, this is one difference. Secondly, echo is a command that means it it just uh, takes in that particular thing, uh, whatever we are writing after it. Print is a function. So it's a function that means it can be modified. The functionality of function can always be modified. Now, print is actually a, an inbuilt, inbuilt function. However, Python is built such that you can even change the inbuilt functions. And that is how, uh, that is something that is very different from Unix. The more, like how, how, far we can go in changing the source code right so if there is an, another function that is similar to print it will be in a very similar syntax that i just showed you um and i'll just share my screen for that give me a second um, right so over here you can see 
even this is a function i am plotting this figure using a function which is figure and it is taking in a bunch of inputs to process things so this is a function now you can also build functions in uh, unix but echo is not a function echo in um, unix is a command it does not take in multiple inputs and multiple outputs and it cannot be changed basically this aspect of changing it makes it a function okay thank you. i think i saw a uh, posting this uh, jupyter notebook on github so i have already done this like just before this uh, session on intro to astro um, i have put it in v2 i think i need to open up a pull request but yeah, i'll put it over here yeah i haven't put that yeah I, i'll open up a pull request and this will be uploaded just right after this session <clears throat> so another question from uh creepy what do astronomer usually prefer jupyter notebook or something else some other ide um so it depends i i definitely prefer jupyter notebook when i'm working on testing something out um this is from my personal experience and i think fe and others might uh, it might vary but yeah uh, for myself it's using jupyter notebook still i'm working on something that i need to test out i mean when i'm working with let's say data for five stars but when i want to scale it to let's say 1000 stars or 10000 stars or when we are moving to high performance clusters when we have to you know work on much larger data and it needs much larger processing capacity we we go to high performance clusters which are basically supercomputers and over there it's it's no use to use jupyter notebook we have to make scripts and those scripts are just directly used as as such so it, those are just dot py files that can be edited using any text editor and personally i use sublime text for that thanks um also from equity uh python is a high level language is there more rudimentary computer language that we should learn unix is a very rudimentary language in in comparison to python so unix is a very good start because the more high level you go it's more functional a language becomes more functional the amount of things that you can do with it becomes more functional but as you go to more rudimentary languages like c or maybe like unix scripting you are allowed more you know you, those are more faster so you are allowed to do data manipulations much faster and those are used really well in in the, in the industry when we are talking about text data that we want to edit so for example i want to edit large text files for uh, data of data of stars i'll use unix but if i want to plot that data into graphs and if i want to make scientific figures out of it i'll definitely go with python okay so you can definitely uh, unix thanks a lot shidan i think we should move on to the next session thank you All right, I think the next speaker is myself. Be talking about various Python packages. Let's share my screen. Can you see it? Jordan, can you see it? Oh, Maria, can you see it? Yeah, I can see it. Okay, sounds good. So as Shitan mentioned, a Python package is simply a collection of code that serves a particular purpose. For example, in multiple occasions, you may want to generate, say, a list of random number, say, a Gaussian distribution. So writing such a code in a well-packaged format, you can recall the code multiple times in multiple different projects. So having modular and reusable bits of code is the essence of you know, Uh, writing a Python package. So there are many useful packages out there you can download from, you know, using pip or just from the internet. And today we'll go through a few of these. Um, the first uh, package I want to introduce is uh, NumPy or numerical Python. This is perhaps the most fundamental package for Python. It contains a large number of mathematical operations that can be used in science data analysis, engineering, etc. And many brilliant people have contributed to writing NumPy. So thanks to these efforts, 
NumPy is actually pretty efficient and pretty fast. Okay, now let's import NumPy by using this command that Shitam mentioned. Basically, you import followed by the, num uh, the name of the package. And if you like, you can import it as something. And this something, for example, np here is a shorthand for the full package. So import basically tells the code, tells Python that you're going to need some of the code written in this package. And it's, uh, and Python retrieves for your use uh, later on. OK, uh, the first thing I want to introduce you to is the so-called NumPy array. So here, let's run the first uh, cell here. So here I'm defining a Python list, which is just a list of number, say here, 1, 3, 45, and 8. And then I'm converting this list into a NumPy array by calling np, which is, again, short for NumPy, dot, followed by the specific function name, uh, which is array here. And you give it A, which is the list we have defined. So now if you print out both A and A dot A subscore uh, NP, you can see it's the same list of number, but they have different type. The first one is a default uh, list in Python, and the second one is a NumPy array. Now, why is NumPy array used? A chief reason is that arrays are much faster than lists. So it may not manifest with such a small array. Now let's try to generate a much larger array. So here I'm generating 10,000 once and put it uh, into a NumPy array by calling this function numpy.once. And you can see this indeed a list of ones and the number of elements, which can be found by this comment len, which stands for length, I think. You can see there are 10,000 elements. Now we can try to sum all these numbers together and see how long it takes. We can do this by calling another package called time. Let's not worry about that now. Uh, you know, the purpose of calling time is to tell us how much the code takes uh, between running this command and uh, next, uh, before starting the command and finishing the command. So if we don't want to sum the the list as a NumPy array, it only takes about 0.2 milliseconds. However, if we do the same by using a list, then it takes a full two milliseconds. So there is a factor of 10 improvement if you do the same operation in NumPy array. And this is a key point where we're using array or NumPy array wherever possible. So let's look at a few other ways where you can initialize array. You can just, you know, give the array as a number of lists. That's what we have seen. You can also generate an, a series of zeros. For example, a2 here is 10 zeros. And this is the function you would use to generate that. You can also generate a two dimensional array. Here we're just using two numbers and give it to np.0. And you can see this is basically matrix. Uh, it can also be the case you want to generate a series of random number, which is shown here. np.random.random.random dot dot random gives you a uniform uh, random number between 0 and 1. And another useful random number generator is random n, which, is st which stands for normal distribution. So this generates uh, a unit Gaussian distribution center at zero with a standard deviation of one. Sometimes you also want to generate a uniformly separated list. For example, here, this is np.line space. Basically, the first argument here is the start of the array, zero, and 10 is the end of the array, and 20 is the number of elements you want. And you can see the output is irregularly spaced, uh, real numbers between zero and 10. You can also use np.a range, which actually does the same, more or less the same thing, but instead of specifying the number of elements, you specify the interval between the elements. For example, here is 0.2, so you generate all the number from 0 up all the way up to 10, um, and the interval is 0.2. 
You can also generate a series of number uniform in log space. And this is done by calling the log space function. OK, so that's all about generating uh, arrays. Let's look at how we can specify elements, or so-called slicing, of an array. So earlier, we have generated this array called A6. And I printed its element here. Basically, it's a regular space array from 0 to 10. How can we specify uh, a certain element of this array? That is done by using square bracket here. And we can change the number here. For example, 0 uh, stands for the first uh, element of array. So in most computing language, you'll find that 0, when indexing, stands for the first element. And 1 is the second element here. You can see this, this 0.52 value, so on and so forth. So 2 is the third element. Another way you can specify array is uh, calling from the very end. For example, if you call minus 1, that's actually the last element of array. Minus 2 is second last, so on and so forth. So with array, you can now directly perform mathematical operations on it. For example, you can do uh, a6 plus 2, so all the elements now gets 2. I uh, guess additional two, you can add four to it, six, or you know, times six, whatever you want. And you can also, uh, what do you call it? You can also uh, use array as arguments to functions. For example, np the sign here is the trigonometrical sign function, and if you use a6 as input, you can get the sign of all the individual elements, and it's applied to all the individual elements at once. OK, we'll talk more about plotting later. For now, let's just import uh, matplotlib to plot some simple function. And first thing I want to show you is this sign function we have just seen. Now, x is another numpy array. Now, it's uniformly spaced between 0 and 10 with more elements. Previously, we have 10 elements, but for a smoother curve, we can give it a thousand elements. And y is simply np dot sign, uh, the sign of x. Now we can change the input in time and see how this goes. For example, if we only have 10 elements, uh, the curve is very jagged. Right? As we increase the number of elements, then you know, the curve becomes smoother. OK, so how can we show all the elements of array? This is done by using this uh, semicolon. And we can specify a range of elements, uh, again, using the semicolon. For example, this is shown, shown here. This is actually uh, from the third elements all the way up to uh, uh, the sixth element of the array. Oh, actually. For Python, this is actually the fifth element of array because uh, for Python specifically, uh, you call the elements up to that number by excluding that number. For other computing languages, this may not be the case. Be mindful of that. This is kind of unique for Python. Another way is you can use two semicolons. The first number here specify the starting uh, element you want. And the second number here specify the last element. And the third number is actually interval at which you select the numbers. For example, here all it's saying is that give me the first, well, the second element of array and stop at the sixth element, but only provide array at interval two. We can also change this to three, and then only two numbers included. That's two and five here or we can use one to give us all the elements here from two to seven. Okay, so that was slicing, which is you. if you know which element you want, then you can use the number or the index of the elements directly. Another way you can do element selection is using mask or filtering. Here, let's generate another array from two to 10. This, uh, 
some integer numbers and say we want all numbers that's larger than five, then we can, again, use a square bracket. But now, instead of using the numbers, we directly put the, uh, the conditions inside. For example, a larger than five, then Python is smart enough to know to retrieve the elements that satisfy, satisfy this condition. Actually, you can put multiple conditions here, for example, using a curly bracket. And you say you want all number that's larger than five, but smaller than say eight. Oops, uh, need uh, this and sign or and com um, conditions. Then as you can see, you only get six and seven. All right, so another thing we can do with Python is stats. So here, let's begin with a list, or well, with the array of random number, uh, and we generate it through this rand n function. And again, this number specifies that we're generating 10,000 random numbers. And if we plot it, you can see the random numbers are centered at roughly six, whereas some amount of standard deviation. Now we can find the mean value of this list of random number by calling np.mean, and you just give uh, the array again. And you can see it's pretty close to six. And SDD stands for standard deviation. And again, we can just simply supply the function with the array and everything works. Um, this np.cumsum is actually the cumulative sum of number. And uh, for example, if we put a equal to one, two, and three, then cumulative sum is simply as one, three, and six. Uh, it's very simple. Okay, calculus, you can also do calculus with NumPy. Um, for example, if you want to get the derivative, the key function you want is np.gradient. Again, using our sinusoidal function as an example, you can just give the function two elements. The first one is y or the, uh, the variable and x is uh, the parameter. And you can see it successfully retrieved uh, the derivative of sine function as a cosine. Rever in reverse, you can also perform integration. This is down uh, using the np dot sum cumulative sum function. Uh, and you can see, again, this is what you expect theoretically. So now this function has some small uh, difference from a, a purely correct, uh, a purely uh, theoretical answer, because all you're doing here is doing infinite sum. So your answer is only correct, depending on you know, how much interval you have between each array elements. Okay, uh, I think this is something we have seen. You can also generate a two-dimensional or even multi-dimensional array uh, using NumPy. Okay, uh, I think that's all for NumPy for now. Let's move on to SciPy. So earlier I mentioned that NumPy is used by engineers, software developers, and scientists. SciPy, on the other hand, is well, more or less designed for a scientific operation. Uh, a number of key things SciPy can do include parameter optimization, uh, integration, interpolation, and signal processing. Okay, let's take a look here. So in the first cell, all I'm generating is changing uh, the y function from a simple sign to include a quadratic function of x, as you can see here. And this is what uh, uh, x and y looks like in a graph. So the first thing we want to do is interpolation. What is inter interpolation? Well, interpolation basically operates on a discrete set of data, for example, which is shown here, and tries to interpolate or specify the value between these discrete points. What do I mean by that? Let's take a look at the result. So you can see our function is only evaluated as regular intervals, 
we do not know anything between them. But by calling this function, which is uh, scipy dot interp 1D, and you specify that between every two points, you put a cubic spline to them. And this tends to smooth the data. And you can see it kind of recovers the original shape we put in. You'll find later uh, in your scientific endeavor, this is very handy. You have sparsely sample data. Okay. Another thing we can do with SciPy is curve feeding. Here I'm generating another X and Y array, but now the X, uh, the Y array depends on the X uh, in this functional form, which is more or less a quadratic function of X plus a constant. And we also added in some uh, random noise using uh, the normal distribution. And this is what the function looks like. Again, calling SciPy, uh, we can use this function called curvefit. What does curvefit do? Curvefit uh, leverages the fact that you know what the underlying function should be, but you do not know the parameters specifying uh, the function. For example, here when we generated the function, the two parameters are first of all three, which is you know uh, the coefficient of the quadratic term as well as the intercept, which is two. Now you can uh, use curvefit to estimate both of those values. Uh, for example, let's do it again with a smaller error. So you can see you can see curvefit. Uh, actually retrieved the two parameters we put in pretty well. The first one is three. Again, this is a coefficient. Two is the intercept of the function. <clears throat> so you know the value is not exact because we have put in some random noise here and the estimator may not be perfectly unbiased. All right, moving on, uh, let's look at another data set. So here, what we get is a series of numbers, say the measurement. You do not know how these functions are generated, but looking at the results, you can pretty much tell that the, the data can be well described by sinusoidal function. So what can we do? We can again use curve fit, and our guess is the function is specified by sinusoidal function, and we just put the sinusoidal function inside uh, curve fit, and let's retrieve the parameters uh, of curve fit C. So you can see SciPy curve fit does a pretty well job of you know, modeling the data we have. You know, there's some locations where the reproduction is not perfect, but in general, uh, the trend is well captured by sinusoidal function. Okay, shortly before we end, Another thing I want to introduce you to is SciPy has a whole list of special functions, for example, Bessel function, the Jerome polynomial, and many more. So you're not expected to know what these means. I think this will come later on in your undergrad courses, your physics courses. But for now, the point I want to make is that when you encounter special functions like this, SciPy usually have them implemented. All you have to do is import these functions from SciPy. And you know, you don't have to you know, reinvent the view on your own. All you have to do is to call this function using SciPy. For example, the Lagrange polynomial is recreated perfectly here using SciPy. Okay. Uh, I think that's all from my end. Uh, let's pause a bit for a short QA session. Okay, uh, looks like Maria has already answered the question. Is there any other question? Okay, uh, if not, let's move on to the last part of today's session, uh, which is uh, AstroPi and the uh, presenter is Maria. Maria, would you like to introduce yourself a bit? 
if we start. Hi, hope you can hear me. Uh, my name is Maria. I am a soon-to-be fourth-year grad student at the Institute for Astronomy, the same place where Faye works. Uh, my research is based around adaptive optics, which you will learn more about in one of the upcoming sessions. I I, um, I do both observing observational science and instrumentation. My observations are centered around um, imaging what are called protoplanetary disks mm -hmm. and uh, fitting model of finding fitting models to them to understand how different structures in those disks are formed. And my instrumentation work involves um, uh, involves an upgrade to the existing adaptive optic system at Keck something which I can probably talk a little bit more about when I'm doing the intro to AO lecture. So in the next, well, seven minutes, I will in very, very important astronomy uh, package in Python. Hopefully I can get through most of what I planned. <laughs> uh, it's called AstroPy. It's a bit, it basically contains almost everything you need when, uh, within the realm of astronomy research depending on the problem in astronomy that you're dealing with, whether it's to plot a model to a data set, to um, analyze your data set, uh, to predict something based on modeling, uh, predict something based on the data you have so far, Astrofy and its associated packages have a lot of different tools. And I will try my best to, ex uh, to introduce those tools. So, uh um, in this lesson, I will quickly go over what AstroPy is, what are some of the sub packages, and some important sub packages that I think you need to know. And if we have time, I can also answer some of your questions in the end. So, what is AstroPy? It is a Python package that offers a variety of tools and functions, which, as I mentioned earlier, is useful for astronomy and astrophysics whether it's to plan an observation, to reduce the data you've got from an observing run, analyzing the data, and or having to do other arithmetic modeling tasks involving the set data. So um, so the one part that I accidentally skipped, but I can probably quickly show you guys is, um, yes, um, how to install or import AstroPy if you don't have an installer already. So you can use pip, which is the standard um, Python package installer. Uh, so it's very simple. It's just pip install astrofy. Um, or if you're using conda, you can also use conda install astrofy. But prior to this um, session, you might have already installed anaconda, which in, in which case you don't need to separately install astrofy because anaconda comes with um, a lot of STEM packages like NumPy and SciPy, which you just saw earlier, and even AstroPy. But if you can update it, you can do conda update AstroPy, which will either tell you you already have the latest version of AstroPy, or if you have an older version, it will update it for you. The last one I understand is a bit complicated, but if you want to install AstroPy, but you're not exactly sure if you have all the packages that you need to run, uh, things in AstroPy, like NumPy, SciPy, Matplotlib. Matplotlib is a plotting package. You can sort of run this line. Um, all of this is recorded, and I will be uploading this these slides soon, so you'll, all, you'll have the information with you. So speaking about sub-packages, um, you, you don't import AstroPy as it is to your notebook or your script because AstroPy is very, very heavy of a package. Instead, you will import the sub packages that you need or the classes within the sub packages, depending on what your script is gonna be about, what you're gonna be doing in your notebook, so on and so forth. So this is sort of the standard syntax you would use. So if you're importing one sub package, the entirety of the sub package, you can do from AstroPy import sub package, or if the sub package has a really lengthy name, and you don't want to repeat that name over and over again. Just like you imported NumPy saying import NumPy as NP, you can do import astropy.subpackage as whatever initial you want to give your subpackage. Here I just gave it S. Sometimes a subpackage has a lot of different classes in it, which can be overwhelming, and you just require one or two classes from that entire subpackage. What all of this means will be a little bit more evident when I show you some examples. So if that's the case, uh, you can think of a class as a sub-sub package. It's, it's, uh, a class is like a, 
is sort of like an umbrella that contains different functions that can all be categorized into one purpose. Uh, so you can do from astropy.subpackage import class. Uh, with AstroPy, you not only have sub-packages that come with AstroPy, there are also what are called coordinated and affiliated packages, which are all packages within the AstroPy project community. These packages need to be imported separately in order to utilize their functionalities. Um, the, the difference is very small. Uh, coordinate packages are those that are maintained by AstroPy itself. It's the same people who wrote those packages and they used in association with the AstroPy library. Affiliated packages are other packages that are used for astronomy, but because they are widely used and because they rely on uh, libraries written in within AstroPy, they are often seen as associated with AstroPy. So some examples of sub packages, uh, which, and I hope to go at least through two of these, are units, which help you convert or handle different kinds of units in astronomy because astronomers are notorious for not sticking to one set of units. We don't always use SI units for things because it is impossible to, to code distances between uh, stars and planets in meters. We, we switch, we sometimes use astronomical units. Then we, if you have to describe distances from Earth, we would go to parsecs and light years. So to convert between units when you're doing arithmetic calculations, we have a unit sub package and and to avoid having to rewrite different constants and store them as variables over and over again, we have a sub package for that called constants. Um, if we wanted to, if we want an easy way to uh, find coordinates and define coordinates for different things that we're observing or the location from where we're observing, we have the coordinate sub package. These are just a few examples. AstroPy has a lot more. Uh, some examples of coordinated packages, um, there's one called AstroQuery where you can use it as, we can use it to uh, look up a target of your choice and get all the information you need. You Instead of you having to go through different libraries, you can use AstroQuery and it goes through all those libraries for you, like Simbad, Vizier, etc. cetera. CCDProc is to do a basic CCD data reduction. CCD is a type of detector and images taken with those sorts of detectors have to go through a certain procedure before you can actually look at the things you've taken using those detectors, things that you've imaged using those detectors. So CCD Brock is a standard data reduction library. Foot utils is used for photometry. When you have to measure the brightness of an object, you mentioned, you, uh, you imaged the brightness of a star or brightness of something that looks like a star. And it also has other image processing tools. And these are maintained by AstroPy. And when you import and use these packages, you also have to import AstroPy. Or you probably don't have to. I always do because I use both together. Affiliated packages, as I mentioned earlier, they're written by other people, but they are seen as a part of the AstroPy family because they're used by the astronomy community. One that has been super helpful for me is AstroPlan, which you use to plan observations. Um, then there's AstroML. Machine learning and data mining is extremely important nowadays in astronomy when you're parsing through a lot of data and a lot of archival data, those that are captured by telescopes on ground and space. So AstroML is very handy in that respect. Uh, for those interested in studying interstellar medium and the dust in the interstellar medium, dust extinction is a useful package as well. Uh, okay, so now that since I see that we're already past the hour, I well, I have time to go over one set of packages uh, for play, for using astronomical quantities. Uh, so we have two of those, astropy.units and astropy.constants. As I mentioned earlier, astropy.units is helpful when you're handling and calculating using different quantities with different units. So this is how you'd import it. You can either do from AstroPy import units or import AstroPy.units. I like to give it an initial, most people do, because if you're using different units like meter or centimeter, you don't want to keep writing units.meter, units.centimeter, units.parsec. It becomes clunky. So we use a shorthand U or whatever letter you like. So for example, I want to define a velocity quantity and this is how you would do it. You would take your number, you would take your value, and then you would multiply it by whatever unit you need. So I want to define my velocity meters per second. So I take 15 times u dot meter divided by 32 times u dot second. 
And if I print the value, and if I print simply Q, I get the whole thing. If I print simply the value, I get what the value is. If I print the unit, I, def I get whatever unit I defined in. And these units are stored within the variable. So in case I have to, let's say, um, multiply this velocity with a distance that is defined in parsecs, all I have to do is define a distance variable, like D is equal to 30, let's say 30 parsec. So 30 times U dot PC or U dot parsec. And then if I do whatever calculation I need to do with it, AstroPy would see them as a velocity object in a certain, in one set of units and a distance object in another set of units and does the calculation. And within that, it will know how to convert between the units and give the answer, typically in SI units. Or if you want the answer in a specific set of units, you can do that as well. And that is by using the function dot two. Uh, dot two. So let's say I have a distance that is in parsec, one parsec, and I want to display this distance in kilometer. All I have to do is the variable dot two, and within the parentheses, I would give it the keyword argument u dot km, so it knows to convert one parsec to the equivalent number of kilometers, and that and that would give me the value three times ten to the thirteen kilometers, which is what one parsec is. Um, and then the other quantities related package is astropy.constants. So I can import the same way I imported units. And what this does is it comes loaded with almost most of pretty much the most used constants in astronomy, the universal gravitational constant of uh, the Stefan Boltzmann constant. If you don't know what this is, it's a constant that we use when we're calculating fluxes and luminosities. Uh, basically, a lot of constants that you use in astronomical problems, instead of having to rewrite them yourself and, def and define units for them and you know store them as variables, it sometimes it's very handy to just have a library of these so you don't have to define them on your own. So this is tied with the, so you can import this and let's say if I want to print one constant, I want to print the universal gravitational constant. So I don't print c.g, it will give me all the details. It'll give me the value. Well, whoops, sorry about that. It'll give me what the value is. It'll give me what the uncertainty is, uh, what the unit, what its default units are, everything. So I had a problem set for you. Um, I was going to show you the answer, but since I'm out of time, I wouldn't. And the notebook for all of this will be uploaded very soon. And I will send a message on Discord once that's done. So a little assignment I had for you guys was to calculate the gravitational force between a star and a planet at a certain, which are a certain distance apart. Um, the equation is very simple. If you don't know it already, you can look it up. And the goal is to use astropy.units and astropy.constants to, to do this calculation. Uh, so in astronomy, if this, this convention is convin uh, confusing to you, in astronomy, we often have, we, we often have like objects at varying sizes, both, you know, uh, speaking linearly or radially, as well as in terms of its mass. So it becomes very difficult to keep mentioning things in kilograms or kilometers. So we use shorthands like a solar mass. So something. So a solar mass is the mass of the sun or Jupiter mass, which is mass of Jupiter. So we often define mass of planets as Jupiter mass or Earth mass and the mass of stars as a solar mass, or how many ever solar masses they are. And units does have those as actual units. So you can literally just look up what the shorthand is for uh, solar mass and what the shorthand is for Jupiter mass, and you will get what the relevant units are, and you can use that to solve your problem. AU is astronomical unit. AU is the distance. One AU is the distance between the Earth and the sun. And AU is often used when we're, when we're talking about um, distances between a star and its neighboring companion. So this is a problem that you can try try out. I will lay out the context for you and a lot more a lot more information to help you with this in the notebook that I'll be uploading tonight. Let's see. Um, All right. Thank you, Maria. Yes, and uh, I think I just had one more thing to show you guys. Uh, in the end, let's see. Uh, da, 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 da. Yeah, um, these were some uh, few websites that I noticed. If you look up, because AstroPy is very dense, it has a lot more information. And originally, I timed this presentation for 20 minutes, so obviously, I can't cover everything. 
But there are a lot of modules, do documentation released by AstroPy itself, and lessons written for astronomy programs that delve into how to use AstroPy, how to use its different functionalities for everything that you require. So I'd highly recommend going through these lessons, uh, doing the practice problems they have, and that will really help you becoming efficient in this. And no one learns AstroPy at one go. Most of us still use the documentation from time to time to be able to use these functions. So yeah, feel free to ask any questions you have and to keep going back to these documentations for whatever you need. And this is not just true for AstroPy, it's true for literally every Python package that we're introducing to you through this module. Thank you. Register now on bit.ly slash intro to Astro 2024.